Uh, I know will be quite an interesting conversation. Uh, my very good friend and colleague, Kareem Sajpur, um, has agreed to moderate our discussion today. And it is with great pleasure that I uh, introduce you to Kareem, who, as you know, is associate at the, uh, for the Middle East program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, a highly regarded Iran expert, and also, uh, more broadly, a great commentator on the Middle East. I look to him quite often uh, for analysis and insight, and we are very privileged and fortunate to have Kareem here with us today, as well as our other panelists whom Kareem will introduce. So it's my great honor and privilege to turn uh, this conversation over to Kareem, and I look forward to what I know will be a spirited uh, discussion. Kareem? Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you to all of you for coming. And uh, my, uh, I think Tony and I form a mutual admiration society. I have tremendous admiration for her work as well and for our good friend Firas. Um, I'm not Lebanese, as you know. I think I qualified to maybe comment a bit on uh, Hezbollah, given my Iranian background. And um, I thought what we'll do, um, we'll, we'll have Ziad start out. Ziad, uh, as you all know, um, is, is now teaching uh, at the American University of Paris. He's written a terrific paper. I don't know if it's being handed out or you can, you can download it. It's being handed out. But I was really struck. It's, it's very difficult to... Um, write objectively about Lebanese politics, given how factionalized it is. And if I didn't know better, I would have thought this was a paper written by a Swiss diplomat, not from <laughs> Lebanon. So I was very impressed. And very, very professional done, eloquently done. Um, and then uh, Lee, who's a senior editor at the Weekly Standard, who's written a terrific book of his own, um, will comment a little bit. And I, I like to be a very hands-off moderator, as opposed to Iran's relationship with Hezbollah, I like to be quite hands-off, <laughs> and uh, hopefully we can have a nice discussion. So I'll hand it over to Ziad first. Thank you. Thank you, Karim. And I would like first to start by thanking the Aspen Institute and the Lebanon Renaissance Foundation for this great opportunity, first to write the paper, and second, uh, to be here with you and to discuss uh, some of its uh, major points or conclusions. Uh, the idea was to write something on Lebanon or on uh, specifically on Hezbollah and the uh, evolution of the political elites within the Shiite community uh, in order to show probably how complex the situation is and how oversimplification sometimes would lead to misunderstanding what is really happening in Lebanon uh, and what kind of uh, cleavages are uh, in the Lebanese society and uh, within the political spectrum of the country. So the idea was to speak a little bit on the evolution of the uh, Shiite political elites and their relation to the Lebanese system, especially that the system itself is based on sectarian representation and on the concept of consociational democracy that should bring representatives of the communities as an obligation, in fact, by the Constitution to all uh, the uh, institutions, whether the executive one or the uh, legislative one. And that provides a certain veto right uh, for each of the largest communities within the institutions as well that are, uh, uh, when the system was designed in another place, uh, of course not in Lebanon, but mainly in Holland, is to uh, make each minority at least feels unthreatened by any radical choice that another community might take, whether on the positioning of the country in its region or on the internal uh, dynamics related to the political system itself. So Lebanon followed that system, and this system, even if it has some positive uh, aspects uh, due to the fact that it allows all communities to be represented, but in times of crisis, it has severe problem uh, because it tends to encourage the vertical divisions of uh, the, uh, the, let's say, the political uh, division, making them vertical, making any compromise difficult, and this would encourage itself also a certain tendency for hegemony within each community in order to have a better positioning, in order to be capable of more bargaining, more compromising, or simply because each community would think that having a strong representative would, would help it uh, defend its rights or even impose on the other communities some of its conditions. And in fact, this has been probably the uh, modern history of most of the Lebanese communities. Uh, the Christians passed through that, especially in the Civil War. Uh, the Sunni had it indirectly through a very strong and charismatic leader that was Hariri himself, who was assassinated, of course. And the Shiites are having it today through Hezbollah. So the political elite's evolution in Lebanon uh, in the Shiite community is not really very diff different 
from the evolutions of other community. What is different, however, and of course, if you look into uh, smaller communities demographically, it's also the case of the Druze community. But what is different in the Shiite community is the fact that the actual group that is representing, representing its majority, that is Hezbollah, is ideological, religious, and not only sectarian or confessional as other groups are. It's still, after uh, 20 years after the end of the civil war, is still carry, carrying weapon, and after 10 years after the end of the Israeli occupation of southern Lebanon, is also still carrying its weapon, and its organic relationship to a regional power that is Iran. It's an ideological uh, relationship. It's a military one. It's a financial one, uh, and it shaped uh, the party itself with time, and it shaped part of the Shiite community. Uh, that supports the party in its culture, in its daily, uh, sometimes, rituals, in the amount of institutions and networks that were developed within the community uh, on the uh, schooling level, on uh, sometimes the cultural level, on using the religious places as also a places of political mobilization, not only of, let's say, spiritual uh, 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 meetings or, or ceremonies. So it has shaped part of the Shiite community that supports the party, while another part that might also support the party, does support it for complete different, different reasons that are not related to uh, its ideology, are more related to the fact that they consider the Hezbollah as their own representative within the Lebanese confessional system. For them, it's a party that defended, between brackets, their dignity in all confrontations. For them, it's a party that was the exception in the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, to uh, either defeat Israel, as they say, or at least to have a certain uh, balance of power with it in many occasions, including the 2006 uh, war. And for them as well, it's a matter of probably a certain identity that is more into uh, looking at equality with other communities. So the issue is, is uh, in that sense, uh, complex. And if one would like to see how the uh, elites evolved from uh, a Shiite, uh, let's say, paysage or uh, Shiite elites that were between feudal one, traditional one, uh, divided between different rural areas, and the Shiites are in their majority uh, inhabitants of rural areas, uh, then with uh, the rising left, many of them were very close to that left, and at the moment also the PLO deployed its uh, fighters within southern Lebanon with a direct proximity with Israel. Their history with Israel with many invasions, 78, 82, and then different wars, including the 2007, uh, 2006, sorry, also added to uh, their relationship later with different movements, including Hezbollah. And of course, the Iranian revolution after 79 as also a parameter that carries a certain identity that is Shiite uh, had its influence on Lebanon, on the party. Revolutionary guards were deployed in the Bekaa Valley after 82. And definitely, the Syrian hegemony over the country played a lot in shaping or in, division, in dividing tasks within the Shiite community in order to have the two uh, large movements, Amal movements that was uh, founded by Musa Sadr in the late uh, 60s and appeared officially in the mid-70s, taking care of what is called clientelism or representing the community within the state institutions. And Hezbollah that was, play, was playing the role, the military one, in the occupied South Lebanon. And that was, in that sense, also a link or a connection to the different regional dynamics. And this division of tasks was also a Syrian-Iranian division of tasks, in the sense that both decided on uh, having the Shiite scene uh, between these two groups, uh, and then the Hezbollah started its direct, uh, uh, let's say, participation in the political system following 92, after that Iranian and Syrian accord. Before that, they were still hostile or still hesitant about participating in the elections, in the government. First, the municipal uh, elections, they were active within the villages, and then when the, uh, the official elections happened, they participated. In the parliamentary elections, there have been an evolution in their uh, participation between 92 and 2009. And in the government, following the uh, 2005 political earthquake, uh, the assassination of PM Hariri, and the uh, popular uprising against the Syrian hegemony, they felt probably obliged to be within the government, the executive body, to play the role that the Syrian hegemony was playing, which is to manage the internal affairs of Lebanon, or at least not to allow a management of the internal affairs that does not 
correspond or that does not serve their interest and their relation to the religion uh, enjeu or to the religion conflicts uh, in the region. That's why probably they had their ministers as well for the first time, and they still continue. And uh, they became uh, more active in all political or uh, economic even or social debates within the country. So this evolution of the Shiite community is today in a crucial, uh, let's say, uh, moment. Uh, there is the mounting tension between the Sunni and the Shiites in the region, but also in Lebanon. Uh, there are attempts at uh, putting lots of pressure on the international tribunal not to function or uh, not to be capable of issuing uh, indictment that, according to rumors, uh, would accuse some individuals or some members affiliated to the party or related to the party to Hezbollah in the assassination of uh, the prime minister. Uh, but also, it is because the Lebanese system itself and the Lebanese political system is not capable, probably anymore, of managing uh, a severe crisis in which all divisions are very much vertical, in which there is one group that is Hezbollah, that, is, that has an excess weight on the Lebanese formula itself, that is a consociational formula. It has weapons. The party can, at any moment, decide uh, on the timing of uh, war and peace in the region. Uh, it is the also uh, targeted by uh, different international uh, actors. It is targeted by Israel. So there are lots of dangers today uh, in this specific moment that are around Hezbollah and its role uh, in Lebanon. Uh, the dangers are for the country mainly if uh, there is a destabilization of the statu quo. Uh, that is not a good statu quo anyway, but that's keeping a certain minimum amount of stability. One issue for the Lebanese that is also important and related to all that is that uh, the actual uh, choice that is appearing to be uh, imposed on, uh, on the country, whether to be with uh, justice or with stability, is by itself a chantage that should not be accepted neither by the Lebanese nor by the international community. The matter of impunity and the matter of the necessity of bringing uh, symbolically or, 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 or uh, materialistically, let's say, uh, any criminals who contributed to an assassination that was also followed by a series of assassinations and preceded by a series of assassinations, I think is extremely important. And there should be lots of efforts to make the idea of uh, justice not contradictory to stability, even if there are lots of uh, pressures or even there are lots of threats or even if there are lots of destabilization uh, talks or uh, discourses when it comes to that. However, this being said, it's also important probably to mention that it's difficult to deal with Hezbollah on only one track, a regional one or an internal one. There should be a complexity of approaches. Lebanon needs reforms, needs political reforms inside uh, the country that would weaken Hezbollah on the long run, but would also weaken other confessional groups that are representing uh, their community and probably might weaken confessionalism itself. A new electoral law based on proportional representation that would allow different elites or alternative elites within each community to emerge and to become uh, to, to obtain a certain uh, legitimacy in the representation of the community, but also some elites that are uh, not only uh, communitarian, that can represent different political dy dynamics and not only sectarian ones. Uh, the electoral reform is a key issue for that. Another one is uh, the one related to decentralization, to the administrative decentralization and to the work of municipalities. If Hezbollah has a very strong social network and if other confessional groups also have their private social networks, one public network, one of the Lebanese state that is related to efficient municipalities, to efficient social, educational and other services in the different uh, regions would also diminish the dependence whether of the Shiite community or of other communities on the networks that are provided by their representative groups. Uh, the nationality law, there is a demographic problem in Lebanon. Uh, the uh, demography has changed a lot. And probably a review of the nationality law of its conditions would uh, allow or would uh, probably not restore balance, but at least would let some fears uh, being diluted in uh, a new demography, allowing also for the Lebanese residing outside Lebanon uh, to vote. And uh, definitely any kind of reform that would touch on uh, confessionalism itself, uh, on the fact that the confessional establishment 
uh, has all public and private affairs within uh, its control would, on the long run, uh, lead to positive uh, results uh, if one wants to be, of course, optimistic. Another track is the regional and the international track. Personally, in the paper, I try to say that the issue of dealing with Hezbollah or of dealing with the Lebanese uh, situation goes beyond boycott or engagement. It's a matter of looking at the different actors that uh, each has an impact or affects uh, each other. Hezbollah is not uh, disconnected from the reality of the region, a certain reality that was there before Hezbollah was created, continues to be there, and might even continue longer if there is no serious peace efforts and if a peace process would not bring an end and a fair end to the Arab-Israeli conflict, which is uh, mainly related to international law, to UN resolution, and to the creation of Palestinian state, viable one and independent one, that could make the uh, regional element uh, feeding into different groups a minor one and would bring also the regional dimension to become not the first dimension in shaping political parties or movements that want to play a militant role in the, uh, in, in the ongoing uh, conflict, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Second thing is definitely related to Iran. Hezbollah has uh, strong Iranian support. Uh, the weapon issue of Hezbollah, internally in Lebanon, everything was tried, and we were not capable of reaching a solution on the weapon. The party refuses to uh, give up its weapon to the army or uh, to become just a civil political party. And there is no possibility for the other uh, Lebanese groups or for the party's foes to impose on the party a certain solution in that sense. So only a deal with Iran that is related as well. A deal, uh, I, I am not using uh, the term with its value judgment, only a certain relationship, let's say, or an evolving relationship with Iran. Negatively or positively, this is uh, something to be discussed. But the deal is mainly with Iran in that sense because it is the uh, provider. A second thing, or third thing, sorry, is uh, the role of the Syrian regime in the region. Not only in, uh, if one wants to evaluate the role of the Syrian regime inside Syria itself and the uh, uh, very sad uh, human rights situation, but also in the region, there is now more and more uh, fears of a certain Syrian return to playing the role of a referee in the region as if they are not responsible, or at least in Lebanon, as if they are not responsible of what happened in the last few years uh, after the Syrian regime controlled the country completely with a certain uh, international and, and Arab uh, delegation of authority, let's say, to manage the country after the Taif agreement until the assassination of uh, Prime Minister Hariri. Now there are some talks and there are, there are, let's say, some rumors about the fact that maybe the Syrian regime is needed in Lebanon as a referee or in order to preserve a certain stability following an indictment by uh, Belmar or by the International Tribunal, <laughs> or that it's the only referee between the Sunnites and the Shia if there is uh, a confessional tension. I, I think this is an illusion. Uh, as much as uh, the uh, attempts at bringing Syria away from Iran seems to me also at least now uh, another illusion uh, that is unfortunately pushing uh, many countries to try to see what kind of role for Syria and Lebanon again. Uh, there is a certain uh, strategic reality in the region that one cannot just uh, say it does not exist, but at least the independence of uh, Lebanon, the quantity of problems that need to be resolved within this small country before bringing again new parameters, I think should remain uh, a priority. And without that, uh, the country will continue to be a hostage of its internal fragile uh, stability and, and political uh, dynamics, and of course to this uh, region in which conflicts and tensions uh, unfortunately are not uh, decreasing and do not look to, to decrease in the near future. Thank you. Well done, Ziad. <coughs> I think everyone came here to watch a violent disagreement, yeah. so don't disappoint. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry there's going to be a lot of disappointment going around. Um, I, yeah, I think I was, I, I was invited to, to fight with Ziad. Um, are you? Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to look for different places to see if that's possible. I mean, I'm, I, I'm at the Weekly Standard, and of course the, the Weekly Standard was supportive not only of the uh, of what here in the United States we came to call the Cedar Revolution, but more generally supportive of the Bush administration's freedom agenda. So um, the, the, the basic ideas of Lebanese sovereignty and independence, I mean, certainly both the Weekly Standard as an institution 
large parts of, um, of what are commonly referred to as the neoconservative movement. And uh, me, in particular, have all been very supportive of Lebanon. I find really very little place to disagree. Um, I, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you to Aspen, and uh, thank you to LRF, Tony, Firas, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and I have to, I, I must recommend Ziad's fantastic paper. Um, I hope you all, I hope you all get a chance to read it, which both gives a, uh, a very helpful and useful outline of the Shia community in Lebanon, um, bringing us up to the present day. And actually, this is something that, I mean, one of the reasons that Ziad and I are not going to fight is because we've already had our fights over the last couple of days speaking, and one of the things that we spoke about yesterday I'm going to ask him about. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start off with a question for him, which, I mean, I don't know how you want to handle the, the well, format. That, that but, works. Well, let okay. me ask a question to you okay. first about uh, right. uh, Ziad, um, Ziad's paper, hmm. and if you, you know, uh, answer it how you wish. Okay. But it seems to me that um, the challenge with Hezbollah, there was a, a Dutch philosopher, Erasmus, who <laughs> There's a very infamous quote attributed to him about women. He said, you can't live with them, you can't live without them. <laughs> and if I think Erasmus were in the Beirut embassy today writing cables, yeah. which we could all view, he may have said that about Hezbollah as well. And that, uh, you know, on one hand, they're part of the Lebanese yeah. body politic. You can't live without them. Um, but, you know, in the context of trying to reach, say, a two-state solution, I always think that trying to invite Le uh, Hezbollah to that process is akin to inviting vegetarians to a barbecue because they disagree with the fundamental right. premise of that. So in the context of Lebanon, in the context of broader Middle East accommodation, how, I mean, how do you ignore Hezbollah, but then again, how do you work with them? I think I would try to extricate the two when you're talking about the peace process and you're talking about bringing Hezbollah yeah. into the equation. I think that's certainly the Iranian position. Mm. Um, I don't, uh, I mean, we don't really know what, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to do this. You asked me a question, but this is what I wanted to talk about with Ziad because I think that Ziad makes a very interesting case. A lot of the times, especially we, uh, we on the right uh, side of the political spectrum, are accused of just seeing Hezbollah in terms of that it's an Iranian asset. <laughs> I mean, I think that is a true assessment. Um, however, it, it is also important to look at the sort of different um, its different roots in Lebanon, and I think that Ziad makes a very interesting point about this. And I just wanted to read one paragraph, sure, and so then I, I, I'm going to follow that up with a question okay. to him, which, which really will follow up on, okay. on your question. Um, Ziad writes, this new orientation, if, if any of you have the book in front of you, it's on page 8, this new orientation affected many aspects of Lebanese Shiites, da Shiites daily life. It also had an effect on the Lebanese confessional system. In fact, the mission of religion or confession within this sectarian system was limited to defining the borders between communities. He's describing the uh, system before Hezbollah. Whether the borders of solidarity or those of diversity and to unite its members under its wings. Religion has never been directly related to political actions, choices, objectives, or the vision of the governmental system. Hezbollah's use of religious concepts and slogans for political mobilization contradicted the Lebanese confessional tradition. It violated the principle of equal rights for all Lebanese and attempted to classify them in categories according to their religious beliefs. Naturally, the link between this new reality and the armed organization having a republic of confessional identity as a reference deepened the sectarian fears. Now, to me, even if you take Iran, <laughs> which we're not going to do, but even if you were to take Iran entirely out of the equation, it seems to me that Ziad has put his finger on the essential problem there, the essential issue. Um, I guess my question is, we have this problem with the Shia community. How does that, the Shia community, insofar as it's intertwined right now with Hezbollah and Hezbollah's project, how do we take these two apart? How do we take, uh, how do we get Iran or how do we get Hezbollah out of the Shia community? Let me I just add on something, Ziad, that you, you can maybe address. I also lived in Lebanon. I lived in Lebanon as well, 2003, 2004. I have great affection for Lebanon. And I think what you said and what you wrote in the paper is absolutely right. That, that the perception that somehow the Shiite community in Lebanon is universally supportive of, of Hezbollah is not true. But that said, you know, that old expression that uh, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, 
I sometimes think in the, in the land of Nabi Berri, Hassan Nasrallah <laughs> is king. Uh, is there, you didn't talk about this much in the paper, but is there um, an alternative Shia voice? Because if the choices between Amal and Nabi Berri and, and Hezbollah and Hassan Nasrallah, then almost by default you have a lot of people who join the latter camp. But is there an alternative voice which is you know, potentially on the horizon now? May I just interject? Please. Isn't the issue how do you create Lebanese stakeholders that really are not confessional, are not aligned to Iran, are not aligned to a given party per se, but are Lebanese? And how do you begin to enhance that grassroots nature, which is, you, you all have touched on that, but I'd be interested uh, in taking that to the next step. What are, what are the, the practical steps that uh, we need to consider? Well, well, do you want to answer that now, or should we answer it later? Because I, I think that's a, a great question. Why don't you, Zia, okay. you start out and leave me be common. Okay. okay. Uh, for, for the first question that is related to the Shiite community, uh, I think uh, uh, the difference that I tried to uh, explained in the paragraph that you just read uh, Lee, is related to the fact that Hezbollah in different, uh, is different from other confessional groups, that it's not only uh, with a confessional identity, but also with a religious ideology. While all the others, whether if you take today, today's groups, uh, Aon or uh, Lebanese forces from one side, both are Christians, but are not uh, a militant for Christian religion, let's say. They are representative of the Christian minority, but they are not religious. Uh, Hariri in the Sunni community, or Jumlat in the Druze community, do not carry an ideological project that is related to a certain, uh, th to a certain religious thought. While, while in Hezbollah, it's clear uh, that they are uh, related to uh, the concept of wilayat al-faqih. They are into the idea of being Shiites and being re related to some uh, Shiite perspective, or at least understanding of religion and of the relation between uh, the life and, and uh, the akhirah, etc. But uh, the Shiite community that support Hezbollah is not into that, is not necessarily into that. Many of those who support Hezbollah support Hezbollah as being the representative of the Shiite community in front of representatives of other communities. So they are not following the religious rhetoric of Hezbollah, they are following the political rationale of Hezbollah and the way it's confronting other elites, representing other community, uh, communities in a system where representation has been till now only around communities and not around citizenship, not around individuals. Uh, and this is the problem, one in fact of the side effects of consociationalism is that it does not allow for individuals to emerge with their own choice. They have to be part of a community to be represented in the system and many of them would, would consider or would think that having a strong representative would bring them more rights than if they are divided or if uh, they make different choices that are not unified in their political uh, demand or request within the state. So one, not all the Shiites are uh, uh, the, uh, supporting Hezbollah, I mean, are uh, uh, religious or supporting him for his religious rhetoric. Uh, second, the Lebanese system, again, one of its weakness is also one of its strengths. It allows uh, different uh, groups to be absorbed sometimes by uh, different games and different bargaining games. And uh, uh, it changes and it, it shapes the communities itself with its evolution. Uh, uh, Hezbollah understood in 2006, probably, that the excess power it has would not give it more than the representation of the Shiite community itself, even if it's much stronger than the state, and then it's, it is much more stronger than all the other uh, representatives of communities, but it will not win, whether in elections or in any political uh, process, anything beyond the uh, territorial border, if you want, of the Shiite community. So this is also a kind of limitation to the strength of the party. And it will, with time, uh, make any supporter of the party understand also that this would not lead to a certain control of the country, even if there are the possibilities of controlling uh, the country. For those who are Shiites but are not with the party, definitely they are, uh, there are lots of independent uh, Shiites who are not with the party. Some of them are, uh, so there are also Amal movement as a, as a case that started before uh, the party. But the solution for that is not uh, from within the community. It should be related to Tony's question that is the Lebanese identity. Any small Shiite project that is 
independent from Hezbollah and Amal and that is trying to compete with them would not go, uh, I think, would not uh, reach a uh, large public and would not be capable of confronting them because even in the other community's eyes, this group is still a Shiite group before being a Lebanese group. So, and, and sometimes even uh, Hezbollah and Amal might be happy of seeing a small uh, independent Shiite group that will uh, get 2 or 3 percent in the elections uh, in a majoritarian system. If it was a, 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 a proportional representation, maybe they can get 10 percent and have some representative, maybe 50 percent. With time, it could be 20 percent. But at least if you follow the uh, results of 2005, 2009, the difference was huge. There's no uh, possibility of any competition. The project should be a national project related to uh, even if there is a confessional reality in the country that should have some uh, echo in the system itself, but there is a necessity of building a Lebanese identity that is based on citizenship and that would weaken not only Hezbollah but other groups as well. Because as long as Hezbollah's foes are also strong confessional groups, the Shiites will tend to follow one strong Shiite group, whether Amal in some time or Hezbollah uh, today. So there is a need of, uh, through reforms and through the electoral system reform and through other reforms, to start creating from the Shiites who are opposed to Hezbollah to other Lebanese who might be opposed to their leaders to, in their communities or not, to create a new uh, political and social dynamic that would redefine a little bit a certain Lebanese identity that is not lacking today because of Hezbollah. It has always been a problem in Lebanon. You know, the 1958 crisis in Lebanon was also about uh, uh, Lebanon's position in the region between those who wanted to follow the Pact of Baghdad and those who were pro Nasser. Uh, and then, unfortunately, each kind of strategic positioning follows a kind of verti vertical division again based on confessional representation. In the war, in the civil war, there were the issues of political reforms in Lebanon that divided the Lebanese between left and, and right wing. But then the Palestinian factor and the relationship between Lebanon and the Arab-Israeli conflict and the way it should be engaged led to a different kind of division and the civil war happened. So, and now in 2005, between those who were extremely uh, militant in uh, the way they wanted Lebanon independent and sovereign, and between Hezbollah who wanted to remain within the Syrian-Iranian axis, Again, the division became, with time, very much vertical, taking uh, a certain uh, shape today of a Sunni uh, Shia one due to the situation in the region and to the demographic factor. So personally, I do not see the solution in an alternative Shiite group, but in a national uh, movement and in national reforms and in the construction of a state. We have a weak state. Part of its weakness is, is historical. And then part of its actual weakness is due to Hezbollah's weapon more than to Hezbollah itself. If, if Hezbollah did not have uh, weapons, I'm not sure uh, we would be around this table. Uh, even if it is a strong ideological movement and if it's uh, militant and present with hospitals and schools, the problem is the weapons. And this is what making other Lebanese really fearing the party. It's the military capacities of the party. Uh, whether the party will become weaker without the arms, this is another question. Sure. But this is, I think, a key for the uh, issue of stability in, in the region, uh, in the country. Sorry. That's a very good point. Did you want to say something, or should I open no, it up? No, actually, I, I did want to add something. I want to try to uh, answer Tony's question in two ways, both of them somewhat pessimistic. Um, the first is that I think they're already, uh, we're already moving towards uh, Lebanese stakeholders, people who believe in the Lebanese state. I think that this has happened through a number of different processes over the last, I mean, if you read uh, if you read Ziad's paper, you see how this has been created over the last, uh, at least over the last 40 years in his paper. If we think about the last five years of Lebanese history, we look at, uh, we look at the Hariri assassination, we look at the 2006 war, we look at the events, uh, you know, May, um, May 2008, we look at the special tribunal for Lebanon. All of these things are creating Lebanese citizens, Lebanese stakeholders, people who believe in the state. And it's certainly been a very rough ride. And I don't know if it's going to get any better after the special tribunal. And I hope that we'll, I, I assume that we'll, we'll talk about the special tribunal. This will be one of the things that will open up. But I mean, it, it, it depends. I mean, I think we have to realize that there might be a lot of trouble coming out of the special tribunal. Is that worth it? to create a Lebanese state. It's easy for Americans to say, of course, this is something, you know, this is something that's important that needs to be done. I think maybe more importantly for 
U.S. interest. In addition, or instead of that, is the idea is Michael Young, our colleague Michael Young in Lebanon puts it very well. One of the important things about the special tribunal is it will signal an end to impunity to political murder in the Middle East, not just Lebanon. And I think that is important, not just for U.S. interest. I think it's important for the region as a whole. So that's one pessimistic assessment, that the creation of uh, Lebanese statehood, the creation of Lebanese stakeholders are going through a very rocky, ro uh, rocky ride, and it's not going to get easier. The other assessment is it's not going to happen. When you talk about, I think this is very interesting what you said, when you said that the individual in a consociation, con would you please help me? Association. Thank you. Associational <laughs> society that the individual recognizes that his political enfranchisement depends on his belonging to a group. Yes. Uh, I mean, okay, so we're talking about people who, this is how they understand their political culture. Um, when we, as, I, I think that this is certainly one of the mistakes the Bush administration made that the Bush administration maybe should have listened to a little better, uh, listened to uh, uh, people in the region a little better. I think that maybe we move quickly to discount, for many good reasons, we might move quickly to discount Lebanese leaders, Jumblat, uh, Berri, all of these people who say it's not going to work, there's not going to be a Lebanese state, we're just a bunch of tribesmen. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's nasty what they say, and they have their own political reasons for saying so. On the other hand, there's reason to listen to some of these things that people are saying. So again, if we're talking about people who feel most enfranchised by being part of a group, how do you, maybe there's not going to be a way to create Lebanese stakeholders in the, in the people who have a stake in the Lebanese state in the way that we're accustomed to thinking about it. So those are both pessimistic assessments, um, contradictory. I mean, I prefer the first, but... Um, Which are you leaning towards yourself? I'm torn. I mean, I, I, mean I, I think that the book I wrote sort of shows that I'm torn. What I would like to happen is the first. What I think, what I see a lot of is, I think, the second. I think it's, you know, so. Well, let, there's a lot of smart people around the table. Let me uh, bunch together a few questions at once. I think we have until uh, 1.30, right, Tony? Okay. Um, um, so please, you get to my and please introduce yourself and, and be brief. Yes. George Bailey with the, sorry. George Bailey with the Lebanese Information Center. Um, I'd like your opinion, Ziad, on the various attempts, mostly coming from the West, in trying to lure the Shia community out of Hezbollah by throwing a lot of carrots to them, like a lot of money, for example, through USAID projects in the Shia uh, areas and villages, or, for example, through giving more political power to the Shia empowerment, like going to the third, third, third new Taif Accord. Uh, we, do you think those, those attempts, giving more uh, political power, more money, developmental projects in the Shia community, would really lure the Shia out of the, uh, uh, away from Hezbollah? Thank you. Before you answer, yeah, let's get a couple more, uh, if there are uh, any more questions around the table. Please. Thank you, Ziad. I do agree absolutely. Introduce yourself briefly. Uh, Radwan Ziad from uh, George Washington University. Uh, I absolutely agree with your recommendations, but I think that your recommendation is valid or it can implement it for the long run. But for the short run, what's your recommendation? I, actually, I think the 14 March missed the chance in 2006 with engaged with General Aoun. Because what missed with your representation that Hezbollah now depends not only on, on Shia community, but also is aligned with General Aoun and very small groups, nationalists, etc., etc., and this is why I think 2006 a chance if the 14 March, because they put that the position of the president as as non-negotiable non position. I think if in case with General Aoun, and General Aoun and became all of them in one side and Hezbollah in different side, and this is I think it's it was opportunity to uh, to uh, to have a strong debate on the women of Hezbollah. But now it's, it's much more difficult on the issue regarding the, that General Aoun. It's, it's more deep, uh, deeper in, in his ally with, with Hezbollah. What do you think about that? Uh, Hussein? No? Okay. Why don't you, uh, and we, Tony, feel free to jump in. Well, I'm going to after the general. No. I'm, I'll go with the first one, and then I'll, I'll okay. step in with the Aoun question. Uh, again, for, for the first question, I, I still believe that the all support should be through the Lebanese state. The idea of uh, making people feeling that they are 
supported and uh, that they are protected by a state and not by their own community institutions, I think is, is crucial in order to uh, create this mentality of belonging to the state more than belonging to, to one's community. Uh, in addition, uh, most of the municipalities uh, in South Lebanon and in the Bika and definitely in the southern suburbs uh, are municipalities where Hezbollah is very active and uh, the party has the overwhelming majority in uh, its alliance with among of uh, the councils of these municipalities. Uh, so there is also sometimes a certain uh, impression that creating some NGOs and uh, bringing some money and trying also to compete with Hezbollah on providing services would lead to create uh, a, real, a new reality. I do not believe in that. I think that uh, the issue is a political reform. The issue is strengthening the state and making uh, the citizens, whether Shiites or not, believing that this state should provide the, uh, the, the, right, the rights of, of what you know, their rights should be uh, provided by the state, they should be protected by the state, their security should come from the state, and then all kinds of civil society initiatives are necessary and should be supported as well, but not because they are Shiites uh, aiming at competing with Hezbollah, and I don't think that there will be a possibility really of competing with Hezbollah. Second, and this is where Hezbollah can succeed also in making a kind of chantage or in making them uh, really uh, uncomfortable in their seats when they are looked at as being agents supported from the West in order to compete against the party, not for Lebanese domestic reasons, but always they will go into the conspiracy theory, whether, whether it's justified or just a myth. This is, again, another story. But it will go uh, into other hidden agendas and this kind of, uh, of debates. So I think supporting the civil society in general is definitely very important, but uh, the state remains the key to dealing with regions, Shiites or non-Shiites. Uh, uh, however, the issue of the three-thirds, uh, I think not only uh, some people in the West uh, try to, to see whether uh, uh, the Shiites would buy it or not, uh, but even uh, indirectly, uh, General Aoun's uh, idea or perception of how the alliances are shaped uh, it's based a little bit on that as well. And there are uh, three groups, Shiites, Sunni, and Christians. So we have to decide whether we are with the Shiites or with the Sunni, whether uh, there is a need of having uh, minority alliances in the region, because the region is in its majority or Sunni or not. So there is, in the unconsciousness probably of many politicians today, a kind of accepting the de facto reality of having three equal demographic groups and then reshaping the relationships based on that. While the Constitution so far is clear about the 50-50 uh, formula, while there is a necessity today of trying to think of uh, how to overcome sectarianism on the long run, while on the short run, securing or making all groups feeling at ease with the uh, changes and without touching this uh, constitutional formula that is providing both groups equal rights and then maybe thinking of the Senate, of uh, creating a Senate in which confession groups will be, represented, uh, will be uh, represented and starting to liberate some institutions within the state from the direct confessional uh, representation. I think we, we should start to think of uh, some of other type, in fact, mentions uh, without changing this formula into the, the three-thirds because it will not solve any problem. Uh, it will probably create more problems, making the country more and more uh, a Sunni Shia uh, conflictual country while the Christians are divided between both and feeling politically a minority, while they should not feel uh, a minority in Lebanon uh, since uh, the country's uh, specificity that has lots of positive uh, aspects as well as it has uh, some negative ones in terms of crisis is a country of different minorities uh, who can or try to coexist and to build uh, a, a different political system than those who are uh, in the region. On the own issue, uh, I think that one definitely March 14 committed many mistakes, not only this one, uh, after 2005. Uh, and I don't know if this one was uh, a mistake because I think that one was uh, already, it was clear in his mind that uh, uh, it, it is better to be allied with Hezbollah that is stronger than the others. Uh, he was thinking that maybe uh, if uh, uh, the Sunni community is already strong enough in its relation with the West, and some believe that uh, Hariri in that self, uh, uh, Rafiq Hariri, was the bridge between Lebanon and the West while Historically, the Christians used to play that role. So in, in Aoun's behavior, there was a kind of revenge against the one who took 
as it was put, who took from us some of our roles. So let's go to the Shiites because they will need us to be their bridge and we will try to, to mediate and to, to become the savior of the country. So I will be the president, then I will look into the arms, uh, then we'll see. I think there were lots of illusions on our own side. And I'm not sure that alliances in Lebanon are uh, just like this forever also. Things can move around. And I'm not sure neither that the indictment will not uh, hurt Aoun's public, more than Hezbollah's public. Because those who are with Hezbollah, whether uh, they, the, the indictment would accuse members of the party or not, they will continue supporting Hezbollah, I'm, I'm saying within the Shiite community, except some of them who would feel ethically uncomfortable with that. Uh, but on Aoun's uh, public, I'm not sure the impact would be that minor even if some of Aoun's public uh, w would say yes, and so let's turn the page. But I'm not sure this is an overwhelming sentiment. There is a huge crime that happened in 2005, and that was followed by many crimes. And the idea of impunity, I think, is crucial in that sense. And uh, I guess it will have some, uh, some impact. But again, maybe we are now in an own issue, uh, too late in discussing what, uh, what should have happened before. Yeah. The damage is there. Well, I was like just that. gonna uh, generate, uh, entirely agree with that. I think that, you know, the, the own issue, I mean, we're sort of past that, and over the last several years, is my microphone on? No, no, you're okay. Thank you. I think, that, I think that we've moved past the Alan issue, and I think that, frankly, Alan has exposed some very ugly things. Look at that himself and at different parts of the Christian community in Lebanon. I, I mean, I wanted to, if I can um, ask a question, just to sort of, to, I see we're running short on time, but maybe someone else can step in and someone else can answer me to answer, but I, I guess I wanted to ask Tony, you were speaking about this a little bit beforehand, and having worked, um, you know, having worked at... Uh, U.S. government before. I mean, when we see, we're here, Zed was saying Hezbollah's arms, there wouldn't be so many people around the table. But we're here now, uh, two months after Aminijad's uh, victory tour through Lebanon. Why did it take so long for people to get alarmed about what was happening in Lebanon? Why did this administration, and I, I don't mean to, we spoke about this a bit before, when the Bush administration rolled over in 2008 and didn't do anything to protect its allies, I'm not defending the Bush administration. I guess the question I'd say is, why has it taken so long? I'll ask a few questions. Why has it taken so long? Why is it important now? More generally speaking, is Lebanon a vital American interest? Maybe it's not. There's an argument to be made that it's not a vital American interest. If it is, what is the United States willing to do? I mean, we see the threats coming away from Hezbollah, so it might turn into May 2008 we, again. We brought you here to answer that question. <laughs> yeah. uh, ask it. Um, I'm going to uh, open it up, and then we can All right, great. go back Good, to no, that. Uh, general uh, question. Uh, uh, Amal had a question, Hussein had a question, and Firas. Why don't we go in that order? I'm going to the Okay, now. Okay. Next round, Ash. Ziyad, you talked about, uh, sorry. Uh, you said only a deal with Iran can solve the problem of uh, the... Uh, of Hezbollah's uh, weapons. Yeah, of Hezbollah's the. weapons. Um, Mr. Hariri, Rafiq Hariri, uh, his idea was that you start a relationship with Iran and you try to make a relationship between two states, and that's what he was working on before he died. And uh, Prime Minister Hariri, Saad Hariri, now is trying to do the same, and this is, was the crust of his trip to Iran. I was wondering if you can answer the question of whether Iran will be capable of doing a relationship with Lebanon as a state and, and not supporting Indonesia. And I would like uh, him to answer also, if sure. knowing Iran, do you think Iran will, and, and looking at its relations with all the Arab countries and who they're supporting, if they are capable of doing that? Good question. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm Hussein Abdul Hussein with Arai newspaper. Um, Ziad, you briefly argued um, against the need to bring in Syria into Lebanon to rein in Hezbollah. And uh, also in the domestic context, you argued that uh, this is an illusion that's similar to the illusion that um, uh, we can bring Syria away from or lure Syria away from Iran. Uh, can you please just uh, tell us what brought you to these two conclusions? Thank you. I just want to follow up briefly on uh, Radwan Ziedis' question, which is 
Uh, I mean, perhaps we all here in Washington have been guilty in the past five years of not being able to look past the March 14th, March 8th dichotomy and, and see things perhaps in more simplistic terms or not develop a more long-term strategy. But I'm also interested in taking this debate beyond the theoretical realm, the theoretical level, the long term, as, as Mr. Ziadi put it, into uh, who are Ziad, the agents of change that you talk about in Lebanon, that we perhaps in Washington should you know, develop the nuance uh, in our policy of trying to support and, and nourish. Um, my second question is, is about the Lebanese army. And as you know, there was a great deal of debate taking place in the past couple of months about U.S. military support to the Lebanese army. The army, as you know, plays a special role in Lebanon. It, it is viewed like no other um, state institution and supports, uh, enjoys a great deal of support in the Shia community, including in southern Lebanon. People who are supportive of Hezbollah also tend to feel very strongly about their support for the Lebanese army. What makes that institution uh, unique, and is there something that we could you know, learn from that to uh, perhaps uh, duplicate in other state institutions? Thanks. Very good. And we'll, we'll get back to it. We'll have another round of questions. And just to add to Firas's question, Lee, I mean, a lot of your colleagues have, have spoken out again, you know, spoken out in favor of withholding uh, support for the Lebanese army. Yeah, yeah, not enough. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, well, we can, I mean, do you want to answer that now or do you want to come back to that no, later? No, why don't you, let Ziad go and I'd like you to address okay. that again. Uh, I'll leave the Iran issue yeah, yeah, for you. And I, I think. Uh, the question is, is uh, excellent, and there are Iranian interests as well. That's why I, I said deal about the weapons, but not about the relation with the state or with the Shia community. Uh, for uh, the first one about, uh, let's uh, let me start with the agents of change. In fact, because uh, uh, definitely they are weak today. Uh, they are in in small groups. Uh, some of them were and. Uh, in March 14, some of them are still in March 14, some of them are in the civil society independent, uh, some of them are even in the political, traditional political elite itself that is feeling it cannot continue anymore as it used to uh, to run the country. Uh, I'm not sure today those who were opposed a few years ago against uh, the electoral representative, the sorry, uh, a proportional electoral system, many of them could now accept it because they are feeling and knowing that there is nothing that could break the uh, hegemony uh, character of representing each uh, community. So there is a need uh, in order to, to make some pressure on them from the civil society, but also from the international community that is supporting some uh, reform uh, projects in Lebanon today uh, to, to go furthermore in uh, touching on some legislations that could change a lot, in fact. Uh, so there are within the uh, establishment, if you want, uh, people who would listen, who would hear to, to reforms, and who would try to uh, adopt them. If there is, among the smaller groups, a certain alliance or a certain lobbying uh, that we need also to, to learn how to do it in, in Beirut itself, to push for a reform agenda, I think that would be extremely important, but uh, definitely they are weak agents. They are not uh, strong agents or uh, those who could impose uh, a certain agenda on, on, uh, on the government or on the parliament. And there are within the government and within the parliament allies and uh, those who would uh, put obstacles and would make a difference. Uh, the army is a very important uh, uh, issue today. Uh, especially that the army uh, is the only uh, security apparatus that uh, could and should uh, protect the borders of the country from any threat and at the same time uh, support the internal uh, security forces in keeping stability inside the country. And I'm not sure that this parameter uh, is to be ignored when trying to think of uh, Hezbollah's reaction to uh, a possible indictment uh, pointing at some of their uh, members. Uh, because I think this is very important, and the army would feel embarrassed uh, if uh, it let go of everything, even if uh, in May 2008 the experience was not uh, a good one. But uh, it will be really problematic to the idea of this certain institution that is the army that should monopolize weapon and control to remain neutral once again if there are uh, chaos or if Hezbollah uh, does anything. Uh, but uh, the issue again is related to the way the army is seen uh, outside Lebanon. There are still pressures on not giving the army a good weapon because it has connections with Hezbollah and Israel doesn't want that to happen. Uh, there are here voices, um, APD is among them, uh, opposed to supporting uh, the army. Well, I think this is crucial. If the army is not strong enough, 
And if the army does not make the Lebanese feel that they are protected, because also, let, let's be realistic, uh, most of the Shiites in South, Leb South Lebanon feel threatened by Israel. It's not something that Hezbollah invents. Their history with Israel from 78 till today at least is a history of occupation. It's not something that came uh, from outside the reality of the country. So if there is no strong army, and if the army does not uh, support this feeling among citizens of being protected by their state, they will always try to think of other groups to protect them or uh, to keep the actual situation that is a very bad one, uh, a kind of uh, long uh, uh, situation. So I think this is very important. The army should be supported, and it can play a very important role. Uh, on the, uh, what was the other question? I Firas forgot. is about, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Hussein. No, Hussein, ah, sorry. Uh, uh, that's an extremely important thing, the role of uh, Syria today. In, if we remember, in 1976, Syria invaded the country at the beginning of the civil war with uh, uh, U.S. support. Uh, uh, Secretary of State Kissinger at the time did some negotiations with the Israeli, and uh, the Israelis were not opposed to the invasion. There was just a line in South Lebanon that sh they should not cross. They went into the country also with the Saudi and uh, the Arab League support to, to end the war. And what happened is that the war took different shapes and continued to, to be run and sometimes to be manipulated by the Syrian regime till 1990. So they did not, when intervening, stop the, the war or maintain stability at all. They contributed to creating a new phase of instability and of uh, chaotic uh, scenarios. In 1990, again, with the Taif Accord, after following the Taif Accord, they were also asked again, and they were supported by uh, the uh, many of the uh, international uh, community countries, especially after the Gulf War, by Saudi Arabia again, and they managed Lebanon for 15 years. And then they took also again the full uh, control of the country. Today, if someone thinks that they will go back or that they will return just to uh, maintain stability without again controlling the country and using it as a card in the region, I think uh, it's a real illusion. Uh, their history and uh, uh, their regional role is mainly connected to the Lebanese uh, scene, uh, if you want, that is used to send and receive messages on different levels. On Iran issue, I think the relationship is organic, and probably uh, even if uh, President Bashar Assad is not as uh, skilled as his wa father was in, in having alliances in, with different or with contradictory uh, axes, he was part of the Egyptian-Saudi alliance, while he was also very much allied to Iran in its war against Iraq, and he played on different contradictions. Probably today, uh, President uh, Assad's son is trying to do uh, uh, the same thing uh, by uh, selling the West that he's ready to move away from Iran if there are some uh, guarantees about Lebanon, about the Golan, about the continuity of the regime itself. But at the same time, the regime is so close to Iran in all these regional files, whether from Iraq to Lebanon, uh, to probably the economic support that it's receiving, that I don't see why it will uh, move away from uh, Iran in a situation that is unclear uh, so far in the region. So I think, again, this is a second illusion. And usually the Lebanese price, uh, the Lebanese pay, uh, historically at least, the price each time the illusion becomes the uh, political reality. Um, I, I'll talk about the uh, LAF. Well, I mean, we'd all like to see a strong Lebanese army, but that's not going to happen right now. I think if we look at, I mean, one of my problems with LAF funding is, first of all, it has to do with U.S. policy. And I mean, it's lazy. We'll throw, you know, we'll throw a certain amount of money at the LAF to believe for no other purpose that we have no other, we have no other player in the game right now. There's no other institution that we feel that we can support, so that's how we're back in Lebanon policy. I think it's... Who, who's the other institution? The, 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 the ISF, right? I mean, okay. what, 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 what do you mean? Uh, I was just wanting... You know, oh, I don't think... You, to I don't, the other alternative. To oh, no, I think there are no other alternatives. Okay. To, you know, there aren't, I think that's a correct assessment. There's no, uh, there's no other institutions to back. However, I don't think that that necessarily means we support the LIF. Look, and it's no problem. If you're trying... First of all, if we're talking about the occupation of the people of the South, which is absolutely true. But what has created the occupation of the South consistently? 
It's been a tax coming from Lebanon since 1970s. This is debatable. No, this is debatable. Okay. It's, uh, well, again, we're going to have no, to No, because 68, uh, the airport was attacked. There was no operation from Lebanon. And uh, the history right, okay. is, uh, you can go into lots of examples. Yeah. I don't think this is yeah. the objective. But doesn't your, um, to pin you down, doesn't your argument that you're not sure if there are Lebanese stakeholders become a self-fulfilling prophecy if you then with, withhold support well, from Lebanon? Wait, I'm saying, no, but the, the, the reason that we... The reason that we back the LAF, again, I think it's because we have no other, we feel that there are no other institutions to support, even if we were to fulfill the dreams of certain Lebanese who say, look, not only do we need to convince people in the South and people who would otherwise support Hezbollah that the, Le that the LAF is capable of defending Lebanon from Israel, if we were to fund them both and back them both to the same degree, right? So you have two arms, which is obviously never going to happen, but say we're going to have two armies on the border that are equally well armed and equally well funded. No, 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 no but the idea I, is I'm to replace to, one by the other. No, it's not I, to I have I'm, I'm just trying to make a point because I'm trying to take it sure. to an absurd place to make sure. a point. Okay. The problem is it's not about weapons. The problem is not about funding. The fundamental issue, it's not about weapons. It's not about equipment. It's not about the army. It's the political culture, and it's the culture generally. Look at how much we've, you know, look at how much we've sold the Saudis. Does that make Saudi Arabia a first-rate army? Does it mean the Saudis are capable of protecting themselves from anyone or anything? No. So the idea that somehow we need to do this for Lebanon to prove what to whom? I, I, again, I think you can take it to an absurd place. Look, I mean, we'll give you anything you want, but what are you trying to prove to the Lebanese people? Because in fact, in a real war with Israel, you're going to get taken down very quickly. So, I mean, that's, you know. That's Hezbollah's point as well, by the way. I, and I think they're right. <laughs> I think they're right. And okay. if you say, look, but of course the other thing is, I mean, the other thing is, how much are you supposed to, you know, how much are you supposed to fund them um, when has, if the point is to prove that Hezbollah can't, you know, that you can take care of them better than Hezbollah, then yeah. And if we say, well, we don't want you fighting Israel, when Hezbollah says, yeah, of course they don't want them fighting Israel, they want them disarming us. That's a correct assessment. I do, that's what we would prefer. The army is doing lots of other things okay. besides... All right, you're right, you're right. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go back to questions, and we can come mm -hmm. back to this point. Uh, Ash and, and Dave had a question. Thanks, uh, Ash Jane at the Washington Institute. Um, I, had a, uh, I wanted to ask a question about how you view Hezbollah's sort of underlying motivations, its, its longer-term objectives, and what that would mean for the United States. Um, first of all, in terms of its ideology, um, you know, it was formed, obviously, its reason for being had much to do with the occupation of Israel and its uh, determination to represent the, uh, um, you know, resistance to Israel. How um, do, you see, do you see that... Um, part of its, as part, an inherent part of its identity, this notion of its resistance to Israel and its challenge to the West and the United States in particular, um, or does it just use that as a way to sort of manipulate and gain popular support? Um, and second, and related to that, when Hezbollah looks at its role in the government of Lebanon, do you think that uh, over the long term it's seeking to gain control of the Lebanese government or have its allies, uh, you know, have uh, control over governmental institutions? Or is it satisfied being in a place where its arms are protected and it's a sort of it has this blocking minority as a sort of confident and stable uh, part of the government? Uh, I'd like to hear your your views on that. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'm Dave Pollack, also of the Washington Institute, and um, thanks for this presentation. I, my question is is about the tribunal. Coming back to that, I, I uh, I've heard a lot about it. And I guess to quote Erasmus, now I'm still confused, but at a higher level. So <laughs> my question is, is there somewhere, is there someone in, on the ground inside Lebanon who is prepared to support the tribunal, if necessary, physically, you know, uh, against Hezbollah obstructionism? It seems to me that the Lebanese leaders have already, without exception, made their peace with letting this slide. Uh, one way or another. And I is there a popular movement? Is there a leader? Is there an institution, an organization? Is there a spontaneous 
prospect of the kinds of demonstrations that we saw during the Cedar Revolution or anything like that that would actually make this an issue inside Lebanon? If not, and I think the answer is not, then aren't we likely to see nothing in effect? You know, there'll be an indictment, Hezbollah will resist it, nothing will happen. It will be like the indictment of President Bashir in Sudan. Is that re a realistic scenario or not? Thank you. I think there was some, um, yeah. The Jay Gazelle, Gazelle and Associates, just to follow up on that train of thought, if we can also move from the uh, strategic to the tactical. Historically, Hezbollah has been a highly centralized, organized, well-trained, and equipped military force. Uh, recent reports suggest, including in Thanasi Kambanis' book and his discussions around town and elsewhere, that they've become more decentralized, essentially recruiting uh, sort of teenager, moped-riding sort of street thugs. Uh, for low intensity conflict potentially to deploy when the STL comes back. What can, you, what can you tell us about that? Is that accurate? I haven't been back to Beirut in a while. Is that accurate? And also, does this show that Hezbollah is sort of morphing into a greater entity than just a highly centralized one? Mm. We have about uh, seven, eight minutes to wrap up. You wanted to say something on Iran, right? Um, I'll, I'll, if I can add that at the end. Okay. No, uh, quickly, on, on the issue of resistance or using it, definitely uh, it's both. Hezbollah played a very important and crucial military role, uh, role against the Israelis between uh, 85, 86, till 2000 in South Lebanon and gained lots of popularity outside Lebanon. Even in the Arab world, part of its popularity, even though it's a Shiite movement, is this uh, military resistance against the uh, Israeli occupation. But at the same time, politically, they are using it also, 10 years today after the end of the Israeli occupation, still as a pretext to control or to continue uh, promoting a political agenda that is not anymore based on the uh, legitimate, under UN uh, 4, 4 to 5, uh, legitimate resistance against uh, an occupation. So uh, this is uh, the problem. And uh, yes, they do uh, bring uh, some nationalist and leftist groups in support of the fact that they are an anti-imperialist, as the left used to be uh, raising some uh, uh, slogans before against the Western or the U.S. hegemony. They are part of uh, this kind of uh, rhetoric and uh, alliances in the region and sometimes among some groups outside the region uh, as well. Uh, their presence in the government, I think it started in 2005 as a presence uh, where they felt obliged to be in the executive branch, not only in the parliament, in order to uh, make it difficult for any new government to change strategically the uh, political positioning of Lebanon. If the Syrians were controlling uh, the country politically and managing it, and Hezbollah was only uh, in South Lebanon operating militarily, then the Syrians left. For them, there was nothing that would guarantee uh, the fact that they can continue to have freedom of movement but being in the government, and because they cannot control it due to the uh, confessional system, uh, once again, because they have only a certain quota for the Shiite uh, representation, they will be there asking for the veto right and trying with some of their allies to make it difficult for the government to take any decision that does not correspond to their, to their political objectives. What is their long-run uh, objective? I think this is very ideological, and this is very limited to a core group in the party and does not, does, uh, uh, has nothing to do with the Shiite uh, community that support them. If they are believers in the Mahdi or in the Wilayat Faqih, this will reduce the uh, Shiite public to a very small group within the party that is militant and that considers that it should continue being militant till, till the end of the times. But this is really would be a kind of very simplistic approach to read the party uh, like this because this would not concern the overwhelming majority of the Shiites supporting it uh, today. This is something uh, they are more and more if they continue participating in the government in the parliament and if uh, the, the problem of the indictment will find a certain solution I think they will need to integrate more to protect themselves rather than getting uh, far away from the state. And if they integrate more, they will get more into administrations, into clientelism, into uh, business as usual, as other groups are doing. And I think this, on the long run, again, not on the short run, might uh, shape them a little bit different. On the indictment, and this is related also to the question, 
of course Hezbollah today after being uh, much bigger than it used to be when it was founded is uh, should be decentralized except maybe for a certain uh, security branch or uh, the apparatus uh, that is centralized but of course the party in it, all its services and in all the domains in which it participates it has different uh, decision making processes and, and different uh, leaders responsible of each uh, sector but for the low intensity violence uh, they do not have to recruit themselves uh, people in the street uh, and ask them to do some dirty jobs that they don't want the fighters, the official ones of the party, to be involved in. Many of their allies uh, within the political parties that are very much close to them do have these kind of uh, people, and uh, we saw them in May 8. It was not only a hypothesis. Uh, it was there uh, in the street. And by the way, they always denied the fact that none of Hezbollah members was involved in some of the activities of some of these people in uh, Hamra or in burning one newspaper or in doing so, even if it's not uh, really true, but at least they want to distinguish themselves from those who uh, create troubles in the streets. Uh, but to, to continue on the indictment, and I will, will end here, uh, till now, all the rumors on all what is being all what's circulating is about a few individuals. Some of them are either connected to the party or members of the party. But there is no proof anyway, and it seems there are no, no proofs, I don't know, uh, how, this, how the chain of commandment will, will be proven, uh, whether they were operating for the party or for a state or for the Syrian regime or for uh, uh, one security branch or for a mafia. There will be, at least till now, no proofs. So in that sense, I don't really see a black scenario following the indictment. I will consider that they might do or might deal with it as they dealt with the 1559 resolution. Maybe a huge demonstration against it as a, a conspiracy or as a plan to uh, damage the reputation of the party, and uh, etc. Uh, maybe in the government there will be some tension. Maybe in some areas in Beirut where there is a mixity, there will be some, some clashes. But I do not see that it's in their interest to escalate the situation, nor in the interest of Iran uh, to use uh, an ally uh, internally while it's supposed to use it uh, in a, in a, to defend it if a war takes place in the region. And for the other Lebanese groups, yes, they want the tribunal. There are some initiatives, there are some petitions. Uh, many of the political elite continue saying that we want the tribunal. But I'm not sure they know how to handle it or how to deal with it once the indictment uh, is there. And we don't know also how the chain of commandment would be proven in indictment uh, beyond the few people, some of whom are connected to the party. And who will bring them, anyway, to the tribunal? The army will not do it. It cannot do it. Who said that they are alive? And who said, of course, that the party definitely will not uh, deliver any one of them? And not all of them are members of the party. Some of them used to be. Some of them are close. Some maybe are. It's, uh, there are lots of rumors. I'm, I don't know what, what is the re reality of that. But if the indictment is issued and there is kind of reaction, uh, a very modest one, a very mild one, the government will say we want to contribute but we don't know how then the question will become more and more complex, in fact, how to uh, carry... I'm not saying that the, the uh, court would not lead to anywhere. Maybe it will, but I don't see today how uh, this will happen. Nick, did you want to have the last word? Not to have the last word. I just sort of wanted to agree about the, about the special tribunal, which is, I mean, one of the things that you raised briefly was uh, this has been a problem from the outset. No one's really known. I mean, what is the mechanism for putting your hands on putting your hands on people who are accused. I mean, if, yeah, if the army is not going to do it, if no one's going to do it, the U.S. is certainly not going to land troops to arrest people. So what's that going to look like? Um, but I will say, I mean, I think it's important. I, I, Ziad and I also agree that I, I don't think, I don't think there's going to be a large, a very large round of fighting. I don't think that serves Hezbollah's interest in any way or Iran's interest in any way. And I think it is, but I think it is a very, very important step. Whether that's in, again, whether it's in building uh, Lebanese stakeholders, whether it's putting an end to, you know, political murder, and maybe it happens over time. I mean, again, these things don't happen immediately in the region. Maybe it happens over time. It's another, you know, it's another cut against Hezbollah among the many, among the many, among the many things they've suffered of late. This is another one that they're going to have to deal with, and it's not going to be easy to live down, and they'll keep accumulating. So I think it's vital. So with that, I'm sure we're out of time, but out of time, I just want to thank you all again for coming. Thanks to Ziad for coming all thank the way from Paris, from Paris. Very informative discussion, and thanks to Lee and to, to Tony as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Where did not spot it? <laughs> they didn't want to see uh, <laughs> coming. <laughs>